Good morning. May I extend to all of you the warmest of welcomes to morning worship here in Lewiston Memorial on this vibrant winter morning. If you're visiting, then you should know that we're always pleased to welcome visitors. We're happy to have you with us and hope you enjoy your time here worshipping with us. And please, come across to the hall after the service and join us in a cuppy and a chat before you go home. We're also happy to see the youngsters joining us for the early part of the service. Any young visitors are invited to go across to the hall with the others to share in the fun of Sunday school or to join in a discussion in teen scene. If you're under three and ask nicely, mum or dad will take you across to play in the crash in the small hall at any time during the service and leave you in safe and loving hands. We're a happy lot at the Lawson. I know it's not easy being happy these days, surrounded by all the doom and gloom, but I certainly find it easier when I come here on Sunday, seeing you and knowing we're all part of God's family together here to praise and thank the Lord. So let's turn to those nearest us and share a greeting, if you wish, signing, God loves you. God loves you. told you we were happy. I'm happy to report that most of the organizations are again meeting this week. Todd's Toddlers Group on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings. Men's Guild on Tuesday evening. Thursday sees our allemges, the short midweek service of worship, 11 o'clock in the church. The lunch club at 11.45 in the hall. Craft Group with their cuppies and chats at 2 o'clock, and the men's prayer group at 7.30. Youth groups and drop zone are here on Friday evening, and on Saturday the 11th, earlier this month than usual, we have Messy Church, 9.30 for a 10 o'clock start. A warm welcome awaits you at all of these, and of course, at our warm space, which is here every afternoon, Monday to Friday, 2 till 5 o'clock. You don't need to book. Be assured that someone will be here to greet you. I've also been asked to tell you that Mary and Gail would be happy to receive material and suggestions for our quarterly magazine, News from the Pews, no later than next Sunday. Folks, we all know how good it is to come together to praise and thank the Lord. As our intro to this morning service, we sing, Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Please stand to sing.
we come to worship this morning, this is the first Sunday that we're having a, a little look at Mark's gospel. And as we journey through Mark's gospel over the month of February, we'll find that although nearly all of it is incorporated in Matthew's gospel, there are subtle and wee differences. Mark does tell us a good bit about the teachings of Jesus, but what Mark focuses on most are the things that Jesus does. We have a, an expression, I guess, that says, actions speak louder than words. And if the words of the Lord Jesus Christ tell us a lot about his identity, Mark wants us to understand that his actions firmly tell us just exactly who Jesus is, just exactly where our strength comes from, just exactly as to who we should look to. So we're going to worship God again as we stand and sing together, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. <clears throat> Thank you. 
let's talk to God. Let us pray. Loving Lord, as we come this morning, we acknowledge that you are a great and mighty God. There is none like you. We acknowledge your almighty power and wisdom. We acknowledge your infinite love and the blessings that you pour out upon this world day after day after day. Forgive us, Lord, when we take you so much for granted. When we give credit to everyone else and don't take the time to give credit to you. For, Lord, you have had your hand upon us over the generations. And you still continue to have your hand upon us. Forgive us when we are so stubborn that we plan our own ways. That we struggle with relationships rather than allowing your direction and your love to intervene. Forgive us when we look everywhere else for help before finally opening our mouths and crying out to you. And as we come today, Lord, we ask that your spirit would be here with us, touching us, teaching us, drawing us close to you, that as we lift up your name, you would draw us ever closer, that you would give us a greater understanding. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who are in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, I'm wanting to particularly speak to our youngsters, the ones that are here, and the ones that watch from home. But that doesn't mean to say that all the grown-ups can fall asleep. It's just that I'm gearing this particularly towards our young people today. And I wanted to ask a question. You don't need to put hands up if you feel embarrassed. But over this winter time, have any of you been unwell? You certainly have, yeah, yeah, yeah. And more hands, yeah, yeah. And I would imagine many of the grown-ups as well, and all kinds of horrible bugs and illnesses. And, and I don't know about you, we, we see things on telly and we get told what to do. So if you're feeling a bit unwell, first of all, you go and see if you can buy. Am I allowed to advertise like Lemsip and stuff like that? So you go and you buy stuff over the counter, first of all. And then when that doesn't work, you're supposed to go and speak to your pharmacist. Now, if you were to, to listen to any of our services from about three, four weeks ago, you would have heard me kind of speaking as if I was a trader dancer and my nose was all blocked up. But it had been like that since the beginning of November. So I did try to speak to the pharmacist, and he says, you need to speak, you need to go to your doctor's surgery. And eventually a lovely nurse gave me something that sorted everything out so I can actually breathe through my nose again. But you know, if you're not well, that's the kind of things that we do. We've got this, we, we go to that, and we try that, and we try that, and we try that. What about if we've got a friend that's not well? Because if we've got a friend that's not well, what we then tend to do is say, well, when that happened to me, I got this. Or when that happened to me, I did this. And sometimes our friends are really not well and we're quite worried about them. When Jesus was walking this earth, people started to realize that there was something very special about him. Very special about the things he said, very special about the things he did. And when people went to him and they were ill, they would be healed. And I wanted to tell you today about a particular bunch of mates because their friend was really, really quite bad. 
He could no longer walk or use his arms. He was really quite bad. And they decided to take him to see Jesus. Now, two things. When they tried to get to his door, there was a huge crowd and they couldn't get through. So here's the first thing. Whenever we want to speak to Jesus, whenever we want to get close to Jesus, something, usually other people, will get in the way. So be aware of that. I see it all the time and I hear it all the time. And it happens to me too. So, for example, somebody says, I think I'm going to go to church on Sunday. But, oh, dearie me, I've either got to work or I've got to go and see someone or I've got to go and get some shopping in because I'm not going to have time later on. And something always gets in the way. For me, it's the phone. If I think, right, I'm going to just, I'm going to talk to God just now. I want a little bit of time. The phone will ring. Or a text will ping in and there's something that I've got to do. So sometimes we've got to take drastic action if we want to take time out with Jesus. And that's exactly what these fellas did because they poked a hole in his roof and they let their friend down right in front of him so that he could see them. I mean, no thoughts, health and safety. There was no risk assessment, nothing like that. Well, just bung him on a on a stretcher of some description, and we'll lower him down through the roof. And and here's the question. How many of us would that be the first thing we would think of? Like, you're not well, or your friend's not well. Usually, the first thing we don't think is, I better speak to Jesus about this. In fact, that's often the last resort when we're really, really unwell, or your friend is really, really unwell, and then we start to panic. It's as if we've got this little panic box and we'll turn to Jesus if nothing else works. But that's not the way that he loves us. He loves us so passionately that he isn't going to want to sit back and wait. I sometimes think he must be sitting there thinking, duh, when are you going to come and speak to me? We need to start remembering that the Lord Jesus Christ really wants to be involved in our lives, not just the good things, in the really tough things. And that includes illness as well. And we need to start recognizing that when things are getting tough, if we're already used to speaking to him, it makes it so much easier to speak to him first and let him do what he's good at. So as a reminder, I've got a little song for us this morning. It's an Ian White song. I'm going to click it down. And it's called The Busy Little House. So it's talking about the house where all these people were and their friends had to let him down through the roof. If you've never heard the song before, and you probably have, it is incredibly easy. And every verse sounds the same. And there's a lot of them. So if you don't know the tune at the beginning, you will know it by the end. But if nothing else, you'll certainly know the busy little house bit, because that's on every verse. So we're going to stand, and we're going to give this little song a try. There was a house, a busy little house, and this is all about the busy little house. Jesus Christ had come, Teaching everyone and so everyone had to run to the busy little house. Everyone was there, you couldn't find a chair, in fact you had to fight for air in the busy little house. A man who couldn't walk was carried to the spot, but the place was chock a block in the busy little house.
Today's reading comes from Mark 2, verses 1 to 12. Jesus heals a paralysed man. A few days later, Jesus went back to Capernaum, and the news spread that he was at home. So many people came together that there was no room left, not even out of, in front of the door. Jesus was preaching the message to them when four men arrived, carrying a paralysed man to Jesus. Because of the crowd, however, they could not get the man to him. So they made a hole in the roof right above the place where Jesus was. When they made an opening, they let the man down, lying on his mat. Seeing how much faith they had, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My son, your sins are forgiven. Some teachers of the law who were sitting there thought to themselves, How does he dare talk like this? This is blasphemy. God is the only one who can forgive sins. At once Jesus knew what they were thinking. So he said to them, Why do you think such things? Is it easier to say this par to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, pick up your mat and walk? I will prove to you then that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, pick up your mat and go home. While they all watched, the man got up, picked up his mat and hurried away. They were all completely amazed and praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Thanks be to God for the reading of his holy word. We shall now join in together singing, Jesus is King. Let us bow before the Lord once more as we bring before him our prayers for others. Let us pray. 
Loving Lord, in our broken world, there will always be something for us to bring before you, some problem, some issue. As we come and we make our prayers today, Father, you are the priority. And we bring our prayers to you knowing that you listen, knowing that you have the wisdom and the power and the might to make a difference in our world. And we pray, Lord, for those who are struggling in Ukraine. We pray for the, an end to this senseless destruction, violence, and death. We pray, Lord, for a way forward, a way that only you will be able to bring with your power. Lord, we pray for the nations of the world, all of whom see struggles and poverty, all of whom find difficulties. And so, Lord, we pray for your spirit to move in a great and mighty way. And we pray for this every week, every day. Loving God, we pray particularly today, though, for those who are sick. For you healed so many people. People who were full of faith that came to you for help. And today we are full of faith and we come to you for help. For we know so many people that need a touch from you. We pray, Lord, for those who are struggling to get by financially and those who are struggling to get by emotionally at this time. We pray for those who are sick in hospital and also for those who are struggle with their health long term. We pray for those who care for them and worry. Loving God, we pray for those who have lost a loved one and their hearts feel so heavy, there seems to be no sense of comfort. And so, God, we ask that you would draw close to each and every one and bring your healing touch in a way that only you can. And we take a few moments of silence as we bring before you in our minds those who we carry in our hearts too. Loving God, we thank you that you do indeed hear our prayers and that you do answer our prayers. Give us the patience to continue to come and seek your face. Give us the patience to allow you to do whatever it is that you need to do. Lord, we ask that you would help to increase our faith, that we would put our hope in you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we sing together, in Christ alone, my hope is found.
We have for a long, long time taken probably our healthcare system, the NHS, for granted, knowing that there are people there who can help. And for a long, long time, we have understood that our emotional health, our mental health, and our physical health are all very, very much interconnected. Anyone who has ever run a marathon or even a half marathon will tell you that quite a lot of the time it's what's going on in here that will get you across the finish line as well as the fact that you need the right level of fitness. And the problem that we have now that we see things under strain is that often we don't have the right people, the, the people in authority who can make the decisions to make that joined up thinking so that every person gets the right care and the range of care that they need. Getting all those right people in the right place. And it was great during the time when, well, COVID wasn't great, but what was good, one of the good things to come out of COVID were people who could speak with authority. And I don't know about you, when I saw these two folks pop up on the screen, Professor Jason Leach or Professor Linda Bald, they had it for me, okay? I was more than happy, possibly because I was a research scientist before and they spoke a language that made it very, very easy for people to understand. But whenever they popped up, I was ready to listen. And what was really good was not only were they speaking with their knowledge and authority that they had, but also they were giving that same knowledge and advice to those who were in government and had the authority to put things in place to keep us safe. So that business of our health and well-being and those that have the authority to take care of it seems to run through our everyday lives just as much as it did way, way back in the times of Jesus. <clears throat> this incident that we were talking about, uh, that I was talking about earlier with the children, when people are going to Jesus because they need help, it opens a whole can of worms. And the can of worms isn't just about the healing, it's also about the authority. I think it was actually quite hilarious. I was just trying to imagine how you would feel. It looks as though, whether you read this in Mark's gospel or in um, Matthew's gospel, the same events, that it was the house where Jesus was staying. It was his house that he was in. He'd gone home. They'd all found out that Jesus was home. Mark's gospel starts very, very quickly. The minute we get to the stage where he starts his ministry, by this time we're only in chapter two, for goodness sakes. Jesus is starting to touch people and to heal people and word is getting round and they hear he's at home. I guess it's something kind of like forfa, 
when if something happens at one end of the town, you know about it very soon at the other end of the town. They knew he was there, and they go crowding in. They want to see what he's doing. They want to hear from him, and some of them will have gone because they have needs that they want him to meet. And I was just trying to imagine what it was like having these fellows on the roof making a hole for their friend to be able to be dropped through. And I have heard, I've heard so many interpretations of this passage of Scripture. I have heard it being interpreted in the sense that when Jesus says, I forgive you, he's talking to the fellows on the roof that made the hole. Probably did. He probably did. I would have forgiven them even quicker if they knew how to fix it after as well. I've even heard someone, now someone told me this, and it set me off in fits of giggles for the rest of the day, that it was used once to say how important it is that we all got disabled access. Okay, (laughs) probably is. Probably right. But I think there's so much more that we need to look at in these events. What we need to understand is for the Jewish people, they recognized authority. And if they were sick, yes, there would be local healers, but it was the priests and the Pharisees who had the authority. If somebody had leprosy, you had to show yourself to the priests. And they would be the ones that would put you out of the community. No sympathy there then. If your skin condition healed, you would go and show yourself to the priest to be allowed to be able to come back into the community. Now, in those days, there were other authorities as well. Everybody knew the authority of the Romans and the local governor. They also knew the authority of Herod. Why? Because they had armies who imposed that sense of authority. But for the Jewish people, they felt that the priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, they were the ones who had God's authority, and that's who they would go to. And there's something else that you need to understand. When I mentioned that little bit about sympathy earlier on, there wasn't a great deal. In fact, if you were sick, If you were a woman and you couldn't have a child, you must have offended God in some way. God is punishing you for all, because you're a dirty sinner, and God is punishing you because of that. So on top of whatever was wrong with you, whether it be physically, emotionally, mentally, you were now being condemned by those in authority as well. And we need to get our heads around that if we're trying to understand the lot of the people who lived in those days and at those times. Life was tough. And we don't know, because Mark doesn't go into detail about every single thing and issue that was wrong in this poor man's life. We do know that his friends were determined to get him right in front of Jesus. We do know that Jesus was amazed at how much faith that they had as they drop him through in front of them. We also know that Jesus just looks at the chap. He doesn't put hands on him. This isn't one of these instances where he spits in the the dirt and makes a paste to stick on or anything like that. Jesus just looks at the chap. And his immediate response is to lift the burden off the guy and say, your sins are forgiven. Now, I don't know about you, me... I would be more interested and invested if the guy was healed. But these fellas, the priests and the Pharisees, and they're there because, well, their nose is bothering them. There's something going on. They'll have heard about Jesus as well. They're checking this out. We're the ones that have the authority And what they pick up on is not the plight of the chap. Like I said, sympathy wasn't something that oozed out of every pore. 
What they pick up on is the words of Jesus when he says, your sins are forgiven. What Jesus is doing is he's lifting the weight of this man's shoulders, lifting the years of condemnation off this chap. So, so many times in our lives, we live with the criticism or the condemnation from others. And that can even be because we have a faith. We get the little jibes. Sometimes it's because of the fact that we have a, a prayer life. Why would you even bother can be the comments that come. And often in life we have lived with this constant burden of criticism and condemnation. And you need to hear today that that is not God's way. It's not God's way. And when the Lord Jesus Christ looks at us, as we reach out to him, his desire is to set us free from all of that stuff. We have to ask ourselves a question, do we have the faith that that fella had, even in his illness, and his mates who were full of faith for him? Because often for us, we've started at the wrong place. We need to learn to start to go straight to the Lord Jesus Christ and to allow him to do his job, to do his work, to do what he wants to do in our lives. But for the Pharisees, they are incensed because they are watching something unfold in front of them that they have no authority over. And they have no ability over either, no power to do anything about. And Mark is very, very good. He's telling us this, he wants us to hear that in a sense, those same religious authorities are the ones who tell us who Jesus is. Because they start off by saying, on whose authority does he do this? We haven't given him it. On whose authority does he do this? And then only God can forgive sins. And there you have it. Because the minute Jesus said, so what do I say? Your sins are forgiven, or take up your bed and walk, whichever, up you get me. Because the minute he does that, what have they just said? Only God himself can forgive sins. Only God himself can release this chap from what has gone before, and we don't know the history of it. What we do know is he gets up and he walks out the room. Jesus doesn't need their authority. He's got God's authority. I wonder if any of them questioned whether they still had any kind of authority over anything. By Jesus calling himself the Son of Man, he's making references to scriptures from the Old Testament that they know well. They would know well, then they know what he is saying. He's identifying himself as the Son of God. He's identifying himself as the Messiah. And they, by stating that only God himself can do this, in actual fact, are confirming who he is publicly. Anybody that had their ears open would have heard that. Mark wants us to hear it as well. So the question that we have to ha ask ourselves is, have we got that faith? Can we put the Lord Jesus Christ right in the center and allow him to have that authority over our lives the same way that these fellas did way, way back then. In fact, whose authority do we come under? Oh, yes, I understand that we have to live our lives lawfully. If we didn't follow the rules of the road, we'd soon be in trouble. But in our day-to-day, -day ordinary lives, 
Who do we give the authority to? It's interesting that sometimes when we say our prayers, it feels as if they bounce off the walls or off the ceilings. But it depends on whether or not we're actually giving God that authority to to answer those prayers and to make the differences that he wants to. The people that were there that day suddenly recognized exactly who Jesus was, exactly the power and authority that he had in that world then and still has by the power of the Holy Spirit in our world today. It's time for us, as those that are called to be his, to recognize that authority, that he is our starting place for every decision, that he is our starting place every, every day, I've said it before many times, that little prayer where you start off by saying, loving God, I'm having a good day today. I haven't offended anybody. I haven't been judgmental about anybody. I haven't said anything nasty. I thought anything nasty. But in a couple of moments, I'm going to have to get my feet out of bed. And from here on in, there's a chance that it could go downhill. Maybe we need to allow the Lord Jesus Christ to have authority over our relationships, to have authority over our workplace, over our homes, over our hobbies, over our lives, and allow him to do whatever healing he needs to do, and certainly allow him to do the guiding that he needs to do in our hearts, in our thoughts, in our words. Every single day. Let us pray. Loving Lord, forgive us when we push you to the sidelines. When you're the last person that we speak to before we fall asleep, not the first when we wake up in the morning. When you're the one that we go to after we've made the mistakes already, rather than before we've walked in and already caused offense or harm. Lord, we ask that you would fill us with the faith of the friends and the gentlemen that were hand- who came through the roof. Fill us with the faith that we want to seek your face and seek your presence. And may that be the case whether or not we're ill, but may that be the case always, that we come under your authority And that brings with it that forgiveness and the grace and the mercy and the love that sets us free to live. And more importantly, free to live for you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're just going to take a moment just now as we take up our offering. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for your continued blessing. And we do indeed ask your forgiveness for taking you so much for granted time after time. Today we make our gifts to you and we ask that you would accept them and bless them. That we could use those gifts to touch the lives of others. That they too would know you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So just as we draw to a close, don't forget that on Saturday it's Messy Church. So 10 o'clock start, but you can appear from half past nine onwards. We'll be here and it'll be warm and we'll have some fun with all of the youngsters. And then coffee, tea, refreshments in the hall after church is a great time to get to know each other better and to have a blether, catch up on everybody's news. Also the warm spaces. The church will be open every afternoon between two and five. And after having my second um, energy bill that was over a thousand pounds for one month, I think I'll be here 
probably every afternoon between now until the spring it comes in. But by all means, come and make use of the place. We will have the big televisions on, the opportunity to watch TV or to do whatever you want to do. We do have internet access if somebody even wants to bring work along and, and sit in here and, and do some work, that's absolutely fine. But the church will be open every afternoon, Monday to Friday, for the foreseeable future, just to make sure that people can stay warm. We're going to close by singing this morning a song that, in actual fact, is allowing and giving Jesus that authority over our lives as we ask him to reign everywhere. So let's stand and sing together. Jesus shall reign where e'er the sun So now may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you evermore. Amen.